It's no secret that video games and controversy tend to go hand in hand, with public outcry dating as far back as some of the earliest arcade titles. Before the ESRB, before Peggy, the gaming industry went through some growing pains. One game pushed the boundaries of what was considered acceptable in a medium that was thought of as being just for kids. And one little cheat code sparked a national debate about violence and censorship, and shaped the course of gaming forever. When Mortal Kombat hit arcades in October of 1992, the whole notion of gaming had changed. It was like a perfect storm. Street Fighter II had just come out the previous year, breathing new life into arcades across America. At the same time, technology was reaching a point where lifelike, high-resolution graphics were bridging the gap between reality and fantasy. Mortal Kombat arrived on the scene at just the right time, capitalizing on all of these things and striking a chord with gamers who were constantly looking for newer and better games to play. Midway Games began development on Mortal Kombat in 1991, with two key people at the helm. John Tobias was a talented artist who had previously worked on a game called Smash TV for Williams Electronic Games. He had been interested in comic book illustration before noticing the rising potential in video game technology. Ed Boon was a programmer who had worked on pinball games for Williams before moving into video games like High Impact Football, an over-the-top arcade sports title which would later become the NFL Blitz series. Boone and Tobias had bonded over their appreciation for kung fu movies, so under the Midway Games brand they began working on a direct competitor to Street Fighter. Only their game would step away from traditional sprites and use digitized actors instead. This technique had already been used in games like Pit Fighter in 1990 and Reikai Doshi in 1988, but Mortal Kombat's usage was much more polished. Its story is also steeped in Chinese mythology, and its action is inspired by supernatural kung fu films like Zoo Warriors from the Magic Mountain. But the thing that got the most attention was the game's gratuitous violence, specifically with its deadly finishing moves called fatalities. They quickly became a staple of the franchise, but they also pushed some concerned parents over the edge. Up to this point, video games were widely considered to be a kids-only space. So when Mortal Kombat's realistic violence began attracting larger numbers of players, parents were worried that their kids were being lured into arcades for ritualistic, gruesome combat. But this kind of fleeting controversy was nothing new. As far back as 1976, Death Race by Exidy Games received similar treatment for its frighteningly realistic depiction of running over stick people? And in 1987, Palace Software's Barbarian the Ultimate Warrior also made use of fatality-style finishing moves, in which a player would decapitate their opponent if their health was low enough. So moral outcry was nothing the company couldn't handle. If anything, the negative publicity just helped the game sell more units. For a while, Mortal Kombat was in the clear. But on the horizon, a storm was brewing, and it was about to change everything. Marketed as Mortal Monday, September 13th, 1993 was the day that Mortal Kombat and its violence left the arcades and entered the home. Thanks to the developers at Acclaim Games, it was available on pretty much every major console, which at the time was a big deal. And each version had some concessions to make in order to capture the essence of the original arcade game, especially when it came to the more violent content. Nintendo and Sega had both opted to remove the blood and fatalities from the games on their respective systems, so this resulted in a fairly tame fighting experience, at least compared to the arcade version. But Sega had a trick up their sleeve. They had already marketed the 16-bit Genesis console as more of a grown-up alternative to the Super Nintendo. So when it came to Mortal Kombat, they actually let the developers create a cheat code that would unlock nearly all of the uncensored arcade content. Now, to their credit, the game was released with a voluntary rating system created by Sega itself. It was a pretty forward-thinking idea for the time, and Sega believed that it would give people the best of both worlds. A censored game by default for the younger players, and a more mature experience for the older crowd, complete with a fair warning to any parents who would buy Mortal Kombat for their kids. It absolutely did not go the way they expected, but there are some very good reasons for that, which I'll get into later. For now, let's take a look at how this cheat code works. 
When you start the game, you'll be presented with a fairly cryptic message about codes, saying Mortal Kombat adheres to many codes, but does it contain one? It'll pause here for a moment, giving you a chance to type in a code or try to figure one out. Again, this isn't in the Super Nintendo version at all. And cleverly enough, this is the only time that you can activate the cheat code to remove the game's censorship. You can do this by pressing ABACABB, -B -B, which is a subtle nod to the 1981 album Abacab by the band Genesis. If you enter this code correctly, you'll hear the famous soundbite, GET OVER HERE! and a message will appear saying, Now entering combat. On the surface, nothing will appear to have changed, but once you start playing the game, the differences are obvious. Blood effects and fatalities are back in all their glory, and that includes the pit finisher, which involves uppercutting your opponent off this narrow bridge and onto the spikes below. Pretty gruesome, but still a bit different than the arcade version, which features corpses of other combatants. These are also played by developers like John Tobias and Ed Boon. So the home console version isn't completely uncensored, but there's still plenty of violent content to go around. And from all the sources I could find, Sega did this deliberately, and developers made the code publicly available before the game even launched. Barry Rhodes bought the game anyway, since it takes a special code to activate the violent scenes, which he says are a part of life. For months after Mortal Kombat's home console release, video game magazines were writing about the Abacab cheat, which became widely known as the Blood Code. It didn't take long before this information wound up in the hands of parents, who had already demonized the arcade version. For them, the violence was now in their own home, and that was enough to turn the existing controversy into a full-blown moral panic. Despite Sega's best effort to market the game for mature audiences only, the simple fact is they didn't really give parents the choice whether or not to uncensor the game themselves. Plus, all the advertisements for the game suggested that it was in fact targeting a younger audience. So the Blood Code took agency from parents and gave it to younger players who were now flocking to the Sega Genesis version of the game. So much so that Sega allegedly sold five times more copies than Nintendo. Their strategy had worked, but it came with a heavy cost. All of this came to a head when former Connecticut Senator Joseph Lieberman saw the game for himself. And on December 1st, 1993, Lieberman called a press conference to show the country just how awful violent video games were. Just over a week later, the matter was brought before Congress. On the offenders list were games like Mortal Kombat and Night Trap, another photorealistic game with mature themes. Both games came under heavy fire for their digitized violence. In Mortal Kombat's case, it was all due to the blood code. Senator Lieberman and fellow Senator Herb Cole were leading the charge for the advocation of full government control over video game content. The video game industry obviously didn't want this to happen, so in April 1994, the Interactive Digital Software Association was formed. Now known as the Entertainment Software Association, this group is responsible for things like the Electronic Entertainment Expo, also known as E3. This group had drafted a proposal for their own video game rating system which would be informed and enforced by all major players in the industry, including retailers. The proposal was finally accepted by Congress in July, and by September 1994, a full year after Mortal Kombat's console release, the Electronic Software Rating Board was created. This industry-wide rating system is made up of several age-based categories. The board reviews the most explicit content in a given game before its release, and gives it a rating from E for everyone, all the way up to M for Mature, or AO for adults only. The ESRB has been the industry standard for nearly 25 years, and the idea is that, at its best, it helps parents decide what content is suitable for their children. It is still a voluntary system, but one that encompasses all aspects of the industry. So, for example, an unrated game will typically not be sold in stores. It's also arguably a much better alternative to what Senator Lieberman had proposed in 1993. So that's the story of how Mortal Kombat's Blood Code helped to shape an entirely new era of gaming. But I'm not done yet. There is one more cheat code the game has to offer, and this one is activated from the main menu. Pressing down, up, left, left, A, right, down, spelling dullard, will unlock a secret cheat menu with a bunch of options including censorship and a vague list of settings called flags. Just like the blood code cheat, the dullard code was found out before the game's launch. This would likely be due to a developer leaking the info or from players who were able to buy the game before the intended release date. However, what players didn't know was what the flags actually did. One of the first people to find out about the code was Dan Amrick, who was 22 at the time. These days he's known as a popular games reviewer, a community developer at Ubisoft, and the author of Critical Path, How to Review Video Games for a Living. Not an audiobook ad, don't worry. Anyway, I asked Amrick about his experience with the Dullard Code. 
his story is that a friend told him about it, so he grabbed a copy of the game early and spent the entire weekend before Mortal Monday figuring out what the flags did. He actually managed to figure out all but one, and on the day of the game's release, he sent his notes to a gaming magazine called GamePro. So what did he find out? Well, let's get the more obvious stuff out of the way. Fighter 1 and Fighter 2 will set the Player 1 and Player 2 characters for some of the options below. Plan base is the order in which you fight the other characters, if you're playing the story mode. Chop Chop refers to the Test Your Might challenges, where you have to mash the A and C buttons to increase your power level, and then press Start to break the object in front of you. The default setting for this is Wood, but you can change it to Stone, Steel, Ruby, or Diamond. One Play Chop and Two Play Chop determine how often these challenges appear. Setting it between 1 and 6 will determine how many fights you have to complete in order to do one of these challenges. So if it's set to 1, you will do a Test Your Might challenge in between every fight. You can also set it to 0 to disable these completely. Demo will run through a demonstration of whatever option is set, which by default is Cameo. This will give you a basic introduction of the character in the Fighter 1 slot, but there are some other options as well. Biography 1 and 2 will show you the ending screens that normally appear when you beat the game. Battle Plan will show you the order that you'll play the story mode in. Metal will present a screen that appears if a player has won 20 matches in a row. And Chop Chop will play the Test Your Might challenges. Okay, so each of the flags can be set to on or off, and doing this will affect some part of the game. So turning on flag 0 will give the player on the right one hit point, so attacking them once will result in a win. Flag 1 does the same thing, but to the player on the left. In both cases, during endurance matches where you have to fight multiple characters in succession, the second character you fight will have full health. Enabling Flag 2 will ensure that you always see a shadow over the moon in the pit stage. Normally this shadow is a random occurrence, like Santa Claus in a sleigh, a witch on a broomstick, or nothing at all. Flag 3 will randomly change this shadow to either a face or the initials BYC. Turning on Flag 4 will make the secret character Reptile appear at the beginning of each fight with a clue for how to find him in the story mode. Flag 5 will give you infinite continues instead of whatever's set in the option screen. Flag 6 lets the CPU player do fatalities, which is pretty useful if you just want to see what they do, or if you want to step up your game a little bit. Finally, Flag 7 doesn't appear to do anything useful. Instead, it locks the level background to the Palace Gates stage until you fight a character called Goro later in the game. Blood will toggle the censorship effects in the game similar to the blood code. Setting cheat to off and pressing start will reset all of the cheat flags and remove the cheat menu from the main screen. And last but not least, first map lets you set the first stage that you fight in. So after countless restarts and retries, Amrik managed to figure all this out on his own. After sending what he'd found to GamePro magazine, he actually started working there a few years later. He's also a secret playable character in the PS1 and Nintendo 64 versions of NBA Hangtime, a game also made by Midway. So that's it for Mortal Kombat's cheat codes, but there's plenty more information out there for the other games in the series, so I'll probably come back to the franchise at some point. For now, I'd like to thank new Patreon subscribers BadGuy292, Futura, Jason, Saulo, C, and Whoopo. If you have any questions or suggestions for other games to look at, just drop a comment below. Until next time, my name's Kyle, and this has been Codex.